All right, guys, chapter 12 here. Um, actually, 12.0 I had to add in because they didn't have a section in this free text through OpenStax um, that encompassed one of the and the easiest of all the conic sections, the circle. So that's why it's labeled 12.0. If you look for it, it's not actually in our book, but you can use some supplementary stuff for sure. Okay. So we're going to start with what a conic section is, talk about the four different shapes, and then I'll give you guys a graphical representation of how they came to be. All right. So what is a conic section? Well, pretty much laid out in the name. It is a section of a right cone all right and what i mean by a right cone is standing straight up and down perpendicular to the ground and that's made by a plane not an airplane but a flat piece of paper for example all right or cardboard if you were to have a cone now you guys know For example, an ice cream cone would look something like that, but it actually has two sides. Okay, so if we had something like this that was perpendicular to the ground and we took a plane and we cut it in any form, right, with more of an angle, straight up and down, all different types, they create these different shapes. And there are four different shapes and obviously you guys know one of them. The easiest one, the one that we're gonna start with, it is a circle. But do you know the other three? Um, uh, hyperbola and parabola, two of them, right? Very good. A hyperbola? Not a hyperbole, okay? That is something in English. <laughs> Every time I say that, I get the chills, right? We're going to keep it mathematical. And then a parabola. We call a parabola. Okay, that U-shaped thing that we've already studied earlier on. A hyperbola is two parabolas that face opposite directions, either up and down or left and right. Okay, and they're not exactly parabolic in shape, but they resemble it. Okay, that's what a hyperbola is. What is the other, the fourth? And I left a blank next to the circle because they're like cousins. Uh, an ellipses. Very good, Kevin. Those are called an ellipse or plural ellipses. Okay. So an ellipse is just an elongated circle. And so I labeled it this way because this is the order that we will be learning them in for this book, 12.0, uh, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, the cool thing is we've already learned about these, but of course, if they're throwing it back in here at the end of this text, then you know at the end of this class, we're gonna be learning even more in depth information about a parabola okay we just learned the basics back then and hopefully you remember those still okay circle you also should remember a little bit about especially if you took trigonometry right before this the circle was in it a lot all right and then we'll talk about the ellipse and the hyperbola which are very very close in both their shape believe it or not and their equation all right so let me give you a better representation than this third grade model that I drew very quickly by hand and let me give you a more professional one okay this is what they look like if we were to have that double-sided cone or just a right or perpendicular to the ground cone and we were to take a plane piece of paper, cardboard, plastic, whatever it might be, 
And if we tilted it at a certain angle, then you can see that it would intersect around that parabola. Okay, it would form that U shape. That would be the only places that it touched. Okay, if we went parallel to the ground like this, you can see that it would create a circle. And you know that if you moved it down here, then we would have a larger circle with a bigger radius. Okay, up here, smaller radius. And if we just tilted it a little bit, it's going to elongate that circle shape. And therefore we have what is called an ellipse. And if we went perpendicular to the ground, straight up and down with our plane, then you can see it would actually intersect two separate places facing opposite directions, which we call a hyperbola. Okay, so this is the blown up version of it. You can see the parallel to the ground circle, a little bit elongated ellipse there of our circle, a little bit more tilt would be a parabola, and if we go perpendicular to the ground, we would have that hyperbola, one being here and the other being up here. All right, so those are the sections that we're gonna be going over today, not particularly in this order, but hopefully you are familiar with at least two of these. Okay, you should have seen all of these in high school in either Algebra 2 or Math 3. All right, this is called conic, you can see why, sections, because we are just taking parts or sections of a cone. All right, so we're going to begin our journey with the simplest of the four, and I told you that was the what? The circle. Very good. And if I asked you to graph a circle, what would you need in order to graph a circle? Two things. Uh, an X and a Y? Close. Not just a point. A particular point. Oh, a center point? Very good. We need the center of the circle. And then, remember, from a center point, we would then have to go what? Out. How far? By the radius of the circle. Very good. Kev, we call that the radius. Now, out what direction? All four directions. So just right, left, up, and down. All the same? Uh, yeah. Or what about all these other ones? Oh. Yeah, you can see what I'm forming there, right? <clears throat> if yeah. I was able to trace that, then I'd be able to draw my circle. All right? Here, let me draw a better one. Boom. I was practicing all last night on that. Just kidding. My app does it for me. So, yeah, I need my center point and my radius. And that radius we know goes in any and every direction, that same distance around, okay? Good. Well then, let's figure out what the standard form of the equation of a circle would be. And so I drew one. And because this point is not just any old x and y, we're gonna give it some familiar terms I say familiar, do you guys remember all of those functions that we graphed earlier on in the semester? We had things like y equals x minus h squared plus k. We had that cubed. We had the absolute value we had the square root. Remember all these? And do you remember the H and K and what they represented? The, the vertex, right? Yeah, that quote unquote vertex, that starting point for us to be able to graph. Well then, 
That's why we're going to bring back that HK. And if I wanted to label something, I could call this the radius. Right? But it's also the distance between those two points. And do you guys happen to, and I don't expect you to, but does anybody happen to remember how to find the distance between two points? Do you remember that formula? The x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And Excellent. take the square root of all of that. That's impressive. Very <laughs> good. Nice, Kev. Well, if you don't know, then what I can actually do is draw this and say it's the x-axis and then draw this and say it's the y-axis. Which means I can then tell you that I actually went from the center point over to this point, a distance of what? To get from here to there, I knew I had to go x because then from here to there, I knew I went y and if you notice what have I just formed a right triangle and do you guys remember what we can use in the right triangle uh, was it the Pythagorean theorem very good the Pythagorean theorem which is x squared plus y squared equals r squared and if we marry those two formulas together, the other one that Kevin was mentioning, which is our distance formula, which says to find that distance between any two points, it was equal to the square root of the difference in your x's squared plus the difference in your y's squared. Well, instead of calling it D for distance between those two points, we know for this, it's actually called the radius. And so I'll go ahead and call this R instead. And instead of having two random X's and Y's, we actually have an X and a Y there, and an X and a Y there, which we called H and K. And so since we know this is definitely the bigger one, that's over farther on my x-axis, and this is up higher on my y-axis, then I'm going to call this my x2 and y2, and this is going to be my x1 and y1. And according to this, then we should be able to plug those things in and come up with a formula. A uh, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Does it matter if we uh, have H and K be X2 and Y2? It doesn't, but for our purposes, you'll, you'll see why. Okay. Yep. It doesn't to find the distance, but we're not just trying to find the distance. We're trying to get the equation for a circle. Yeah, good question. It doesn't matter if you're going from the bottom of the hill up the hill or from the top down. That distance will not change. So the order of these does not matter, but for us trying to do something in particular, we want it in a particular order. So I'm going to take the X and replace it with the X2, and then I will take the H and replace it with the X1. Then I'll do the same thing for the Ys. My Y2 would just be Y minus my Y1, which would be K. And that looks pretty decent, other than the fact that there's a big honking what in that equation. Square root. square root. And how do we undo that? What's the inverse of taking the square root? Square root. As long as you do it equally to both sides, it will stay equal. And that then will get rid of my square root. And I have the x minus h squared plus the y minus k squared equals my radius squared. And does that look familiar to anyone? Equation for a circle. Hey, go figure. 
and not just any old equation for any old shape. It is the equation for a circle. And what did we say we needed in order to graph? What two things? Well, guess what? If it's in this form, can you tell me what the center and radius are? Any guesses? Yeah. What's the center? Uh, it's whatever makes x0 and whatever makes y0. And what minus h would give us a 0 here? h. Yep. And what minus k would give us a 0 there? k. So just like all those other ones I mentioned earlier, the quadratics, the cubics, the square root functions, the absolute values, all those things, even the logarithms and exponentials, we used H and K to represent the shifts because what can I do with this circle? Does it have to be right here on my grid or could I pick this up and move it around and shift it? Shift it. Well then, that center point is gonna be what we're gonna pick up and move around and put back down and then build it out with that same radius. And what do you think this R stands for? The radius. Which means all we have to do, careful, is take the square root of whatever's there to find our radius. And remember when you take the square root, it's technically plus and minus, which is why we have to go both positive and negative in every direction technically. Okay, so I just wanted to do a little bit of a derivation for you guys. There's plenty more to do. If we had more than an hour and a half or so, I'd go through every single one of them and kind of dig a little bit deeper. But the main thing you guys need to know is what it is and then obviously how to use it in order to graph. And don't forget why we graph. What does every point on this circle represent in this equation? I'll be real impressed if anybody gets this. Go ahead, Emily. She's like, oh, I don't know now. Yeah, well, I was going to say the radius, and then you said that, so I don't know. Good. It won't give us the radius, right? But every single one of these points, which are some x comma y, if I'm to plug them in for x and y, it will make this true. And those are what we call solutions. They're answers, solutions to our equation. Okay, that's why we graph, right? Just like when we used to graph a line, every single one of those points represented a solution to that equation, whether it was written like that or like this. And we knew that they were linear equations because the X and the Y were both to the first power. How can we tell for all four of these different conics what it's going to be? Well, notice for a circle, either this form or that form, notice the x is squared and the y is squared. And it's going to equal some number, some radius squared. So that's what makes it a circle. Okay? What we're going to do in the next section to elongate one part of my circle, to make it an ellipse, is I'm gonna throw a number in front of one or both. And that's going to elongate it in both the X and the Y, which will not make it the same in every direction like we have with the circle. Okay, so whenever both your X and Y are squared, whether it's shifted or not, whenever my X and Y are both squared, and their coefficients are the same, then you will go out the same in every direction. We call it a circle in a radius.
okay, when there's a number in front that is different, okay, we'll call it A and B because they can be whatever, anything. Then it's going to be an ellipse. All right, and we'll talk about what happens to that in order to make it a hyperbola. Okay, so let's just do a quick example and then we'll get to the next section of ellipses. Find the center radius and then graph. Now I said the following equation. How are you going to know on the exam that this is actually a circle and not an ellipse or a hyperbola or parabola? By simplifying it? What does that mean? Well, to like make it into the form of a circle. That's right. Now, how did you know it's a circle? Oh, oh, because the X and the Y have the same coefficients. Very good. All squared. They are both squared and have the same coefficient of one. Now, how else could you have used your intellect without using your math to know that this was a circle? They asked for the center and radius, <laughs> right? This is the only one that has a radius and a center. All right, so very good. We are going to have to take this and make it look like that. Which means, sorry to say it, we are going to have to complete the square not once but twice and if you guys remember way back when we were solving quadratic equations and we learned that quadratic formula we learned how to factor and solve using that zero property I mentioned to you that you're gonna have to know even though you can use those other two methods you're gonna have to know how to complete the square here we are. So what I'm gonna start by doing is collecting all of the like things. So I'm gonna put the x squared, the six x, and then I'm gonna take the y squared and the y. And then I'm gonna take that 33 and I'm gonna move it over. So that I can then start to complete the square. So I'm going to go slow on this one just to remind you how to do that. But what would we have to do next? Anybody remember how to complete the square? We take uh, the half of B and then square it. Very good, Kevin. So what he means by B is remember the AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero are things that we tried to factor. And we don't even just want these things to be any old factors. We want them to be the same so that we can write it squared. That's what they mean by completing the square. So we are going to take half of this, which is negative three, and we're going to square that to go in this square. Now remember, whatever I add to one side, I gotta add it to the other. So to keep this equation equivalent, equal, whatever I add here, I'm gonna to have to add here. And whatever I add here, I'm gonna to have to add there. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take half, I'll use a different color, half of negative six, which is negative three, squared is always gonna be positive. Whenever we square something, it's gonna be positive. Now, if I add nine to the left side of my equation, I'm gonna to have to add nine to my right side. Then I'm gonna do the same thing, but to what? 14. Yeah, that 14 Y. And what is half of 14? Seven. And what is seven squared? 49. So I'm going to take the 49ers to win the Super Bowl next year because we're getting rid of Jimmy G. No. Uh, I'm not going to get on a tangent. 
I got to make sure that I add that 49 again to both sides. Now, why did we randomly take half and square it to go there, half and square it to go there? What are we trying to accomplish? Two same factors multiplied together, which we can then write like this, because then that gives us our center and whatever's left over, the square root of it would be our radius. So by taking that, I will then have this plus this that I can hopefully factor and they turn out to be the same. And here's the nice part, guys. I only do this once. I'm never going to have to factor this. I forced it to be a certain way. I know that by taking half of this and squaring it, that I'm going to get the same thing here and here. So we know that the x times the x, if we were to FOIL distribute this out, would give me this. I know that my signs have to be the same in order to multiply to a positive 9. And I know the same thing is going to add up to that negative 6. And that would be, here's the cool part, guys, that every single time. A negative 3. including its sign. Those are the things that will both multiply to positive 9 and combine to my negative 6 when adding them after I distribute this out. So guess what? I'm never going to do that again. Because I know that I'm going to get the same thing by what I forced it to be. So do me a favor, look at this one and tell me what would it be? Y plus seven squared. How'd you get that so fast, Ant? Because uh, half of 14, seven. Including its sign. We know that seven times seven would multiply to 49, and we know seven plus seven would add up to 14Y. Beautiful. Then you don't have to go through all the factoring just go from here to there, which is why I said I'd only do that once. I want to get there quicker and simpler. And since we did what we did and forced it to be that, we know it will always be that. Now, you do have to also clean up the right side. So don't forget you had your original 33 that we added over. And then we got a 9 and a 49 together. So what is 33 and 9? 42. And then add 49 to that. What's 40 and 40? 80. And 2 and 9? 11. So that gives me? 91. Which means we now have it in our standard form, and we would have to graph this that had a center of what? 3, negative 7. Very good. Don't forget to take the opposite of those things to zero this out and zero this out. So that would be a 3 comma 7. That is negative. That we would shift right 3 down 7. And then we would have to take the what of that 91? Uh, the square root. That's right. And so that would give me a final answer or graph of right three, down seven, plot my point. And then from there, I don't want to just hope that it's right, but we will have to go a square to 91, which we know. The square root of 81 is 9. The square root of 91, we don't know. But the square root of 100, we do know, is 10. So we'd have to go somewhere between 9 and 10. In what directions? All directions. Now, it's hard to go all directions. I'm not going to measure this out to be that 9.5-ish. But I can go about nine and a half here, 
nine and a half here, nine and a half here, nine and a half here, and then draw my graph. Okay, so just keep that in mind. When we do graph these things, we will go up, down, left, and right, whatever that radius is. Cool? I tried to tackle pretty much everything in one problem, one example. And that is taking this generic form and rewriting it by completing the square twice to find both our center and then taking the square root to find our radius. Okay, but that's it for the first section. Now we're going to do similar things for the following. 12, 1, 2, and 3. So we said an ellipse is simply an elongated what? Circle. That's right. So then what do you guys think we must do to that equation of a circle in order to create an ellipse? If we want to elongate it, and by it I mean the circle, what do you think we'd have to do to this equation? Divide it. Ah, uh, so Kevin knows the look of it, right? But we're going to have to multiply it by anything that is different. And that would force it to be elongated in either the X or the Y. That's right. Now, this is kind of ugly because now we got numbers in front. We don't really know how they act. So there is, again, another form of the equation for an ellipse that we will be dealing with. Okay? And I'll get to that in a minute, but Kevin hit it. So I'll just go ahead and say it now. What we're going to end up doing is we're going to try to get this, what we used to call the radius for a circle. We're going to try to always get it set equal to one. Okay, and there's a whole explanation of why, but again, for time's sake, I'm just going to tell you that's what we're going to do. Okay? But that means in order to do that, we'd have to divide everything by that radius squared number which is going to then take this and make it that one. But then these things are possibly going to be able to be canceled out in some way. And it would be really nice if these canceled to be ones up here and we'd only have some stuff down here. And that's the form that these usually take on. Okay. Now these can be switched. There is a difference between the A and the B. We're always going to say that the A is greater than the B. Because if this is bigger and it's under the X, then guess what? It's elongated more in the X direction than it would be for the Y. Because remember, our goal is to zero things out. And if I zeroed all of this out, then to solve for the y, I'd have to multiply over that b squared. And then I'd have to take the square root, which would just be the b. And then I'd have to add over the k. That would give me the distance. I'd have to go in the y direction. I don't want to have to do that every time. So that's why we call it a squared and b squared. And if we just take the square root of that, we get the distance that we would go in the x direction. Take the square root of that, we get the distance we would go in the y direction. Again, from my what? What do you think the h and k represent? The center. Very good. Now here's what's weird. Can I just be given a center and a radius? Well, no, that creates a circle. So we still need that center which would be our HK to keep things consistent. But now we need to know how far we go in the X direction and how far we go in the Y direction 
which we just mentioned, will be either the A or the B, depending on if it's a horizontal or a longer in the vertical ellipse. But what would you need to graph then? Well, this is where it's kind of weird. And the cool thing is we're not going to really do this, but check it out. You would actually need a little bit more than that simple circle where we just needed the center and then the same distance out everywhere. You'd actually need these two points what are called the focus point. And instead of saying focuses, we call them foci. Okay? These two points in particular, which are going to be some distance from my center point, if we were to put these two push pins in, and we had a piece of string that was a certain distance, and we took our pen or pencil, and we stretched it out, and we moved it around, it would create this perfect ellipse. Now, of course, I'm not going to require that of you, but we still want to know and talk about all these different new pieces, okay? Not just the A's and the B's and the center points, HK. We're going to talk about these two critical points we call the focuses or foci. We're also going to talk about the length across each of these two because those are what we're going to graph to get those four points just like we did with the circle and then we'll try to draw it the best that we can without doing anything too fancy. So here is a graph of all the different and new things that we're going to be labeling and talking about. Okay, and this distance will change, but it will always be the same to get from either the left or the right, or if they're up and down, those foci. Okay, so when we have a longer distance, we call it the major axis. And a shorter distance, the minor axis. Notice everything goes through the center. The center is the most important point, okay? But technically, to draw it correctly and perfectly, we would also need to have these two focus points. Together, we call foci. So if we were to cut right there along that minor axis, do you guys kind of see what this shape looks like? Kind of resembles a uh, what? Parabola. A parabola. That's right. It looks like a parabola, which is why we called this point right here the vertex. And again, if I was to take it here, that way, it looks like a parabola. So that's why these are called the vertices. That's what it is, plural, instead of vertexes. Okay. In these other two points, on the minor, the smaller part, are called the co-vertices, the co-captains, if you will. Because if we can get these four points from our center, then that's enough for us to be able to draw a decent enough ellipse. Okay? So all of these things we need to know and then know how to find. So definitely want to take a picture of this. Make sure that you have that written down, which I already gave you. And then we'll talk about how to find all these different things. Because if I was to know the center, the H and K, which would be here, and then I took the square root of this, and I went that A in the X direction, both positively and negatively, then those are going to give me my two vertices. And that would be a distance of A, and that would be a distance of A. So all together, that's a length of what? I believe that would be 2A. Yes, it would. And that's what we call the major axis. Very good, Rich. So those are all the pieces that they're then giving you. And then same thing with the minor axis 
if we went a distance from the center of B in both the positive and the negative, this is then what is called the minor axis, which would be 2B. Or not 2B. I mean, that is the question, isn't it? Right? We're trying to figure out all of this information. But again, notice that these are always equal to 1, and the A's and the B's can switch positions. Remember, A is the one that's always the biggest. And if it's under the X, then it is going to be called a horizontal ellipse. If the A is the bigger number under the Y squared part, then it's going to be the vertical ellipse. And everything pretty much stays the same. The one thing I do want to highlight, though, is this. That is how we find the foci, the two focal points. So I'm going to call it the focal distance. And the way we find that focal distance, we're going to call it letter C. It is equal to C squared equals A squared minus B squared. That is how we call or find the focal distance. So of course, we're going to have to take the square root. OK, and that's pretty much it. Other than the fact that, of course, these things can change. A horizontal ellipse, a vertical ellipse. And the focal points, those foci, will always be on that major axis. They will always be in the direction that we are given, either the x or the y. And remember, everything is centered around the what? The center. That is by far our most important point. All right? So there it all is mapped out for you if you want to take a screenshot of that or watch it back. A lot of information going on there. I'm going to try to make it all make sense with an example or two. So here's our first. And of course, I'm trying to couple a few things together so that we don't have to do a plethora of examples we can just get a lot done with one so they want to know the center vertices covertices and foci of this ellipse and in order to give them any and all of that and even graph it we'd have to make sure that this is put into our standard form. So what does that mean we're going to have to do first? Subtract 21. Good. We can get rid of that. We don't need it, but we do need to collect our x's and our y's. OK, so I'm going to do both of those things at the same time. If you're good with it, I will put the 4x squared minus 24x and then I know I'm gonna have to add something right and then I'm gonna put the y squared with the y and again I know I'm gonna have to add something and it's all gonna be equal to that negative 21 and those two boxes that I just know are placeholders for the things that I'm going to have to add in order to complete the square now here's where these are a little bit different than circles. Circles were nice because we knew when that wasn't there, we could factor pretty easily. But now that there's a leading coefficient, we don't like that. So guess what we're going to do to get rid of it? Try 
Try and factor it out. Very good. Now I could divide, but then I'd have to divide to everything. And that's not gonna work well here, here, or here. So very good. How do we divide to only things that we want? Anthony said, factor. So I'm actually going to just these things, factor a four out. And you know, to undo dividing, we multiply. That's all factoring is. And that allows me to cancel this to be x squared minus, careful, 6x. A lot of people will just pull it out in front of the x squared and then they'll put 24 there. Okay, don't make that mistake. But then remember, I still wanna do plus my box. The nice thing is this is already a one. So I'm just gonna rewrite this one as is. But how do we figure out what goes in those boxes? Do you guys remember? Yeah. Uh, make uh, B over two squared. That's right. We take half of our B term and then square it to go in that square. So I will take half of negative six, which again is negative three squared is positive nine. I will take half of that B term with the Y squared parts. And careful, it's a one squared would be one. Which means if I'm going to add a nine over here and a one over here to this side of the equal sign, I need to do the same over here. Add a nine and add a one. But this is where it gets a little weird. Everybody good so far? We added in that extra step of factoring out a four. That's gonna come back to haunt us again. Because I know that this is gonna be able to be factored and this is gonna be able to be factored as the same two factors squared. And that's our goal. But notice by adding the nine and adding the one to both sides, I'm still keeping this equal, correct? wrong and here's why notice that this is all good because this is all we have so adding one here and adding one there that's great that's kosher but am i actually only adding nine here no look it's in this set of parentheses and what's being done to that whole set of parentheses It's being multiplied by four to get back our original stuff. So guess what? You're not just adding nine, you're adding four times the nine, which means you just have to be cautious and careful that if you are multiplying by a four to that nine, that you multiply by a four to that nine on the other side so that you do indeed keep it equal. So it's not there, you can't see it, but you have to make sure that you cover it. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a little tricky, and by the way, it can happen twice. It can be here as well. We could have had to have factored out a two, and then it would have been two times one, and we would have had to put a two there to make it equal on both sides. Okay, so let's finish this because we know that this factors to be a certain thing. Remember, I told you it was always gonna be whatever you took half of and don't lose that four on the outside. So it would become what when we factor? X minus three squared. Good, because again, we know that times that multiplies to positive nine and that plus that combines to our negative six. Don't forget that four on the outside. This one, we threw parentheses around, but there was nothing out in front, so we didn't really need a one here, All right? But I know that this would factor to be what? Careful. Y plus one squared. Thank you for showing up, Richard. I have another person talking to me. I appreciate it. Remember, it's always gonna be half of that. 
including its sign. And all we got to do is clean up the other side, which remember this now became a 36. And this is still a 1. So what is 37 less 21? Sixteen. And if we were in circle land, we would circle it and be done. We'd be able to give them any and all information and or graph. But because we are dealing with the ellipse, remember what did we always want to get it set equal to? One. So what would I have to do to this in order to get it to be a one? And don't say subtract 15. Divide by 16. And if I do it to that to keep it equal, I got to do that to everything. And that now allows me to, because we're multiplying, I can cancel a four with each of those. Nothing to do there because it's a one and all of that. So my final product looks like that. which means you should be able to tell me all the things that they requested at this point. And that includes the center. We're going to need the A. We're going to need the B, even though they didn't ask for it. Then they asked for the vertices. They asked for the co-vertices. and foci. And then I wanted to make sure that you guys knew how to graph as well. So I'm gonna give you 60 seconds. See how much of that stuff that you can find. And remember what they actually asked for was this, 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 and that. But we need these things to find all of this and we still are gonna to have to do something to find that. But go ahead, 60 seconds, see if you guys can figure out as much of that as possible. All right, let's see what you guys came up with. Who can give me the center? Uh, it's three negative one. Good, just to make sure everyone understands how we got that, we're zeroing out the squared terms, right? To get this to be a zero, we'd be a three and a negative one. And remember, this is the most important point of all of it because it all comes from the center. Careful, what would we call the A and what would we call the B? Um, I'm guessing here it's gonna be A is four and B is one. Very good. Square root of 16 is four for our A. That's the part that's under. And then this one, though, would be what? Two. That's right. Uh, two root two. Oh, no, just two. Gotcha. Square root of four is just two. That's right. And remember, the longer one is going to be what gives me my vertices. And the shorter one will therefore give me the co-vertices. And all of these distances are going to be done from our center in the particular letter that they are accompanied by. So that means to find my vertices, I'm gonna use the longer one, always, from my center, and since it happens to be under the Y, I'm only going to change the Y value. So I know my vertices are gonna be three comma something and three comma something. How am I gonna find those somethings? What did we say it was going to change by? By A. By A and to what? To positive and negative? Oh. Or to uh, Y? Up and down. Positive and negative, that's right, to the Y value. Both of you guys answered. I know it's kind of vague. So I'm just going to go plus and minus 4 in the Y direction, which means add 4 to a negative 1. What do you get? 3. 3. And subtract. Negative five. Excellent. Oh, and by the way, how much of this have I graphed? Like 
I haven't graphed anything, yeah. right? I haven't graphed a thing yet. And I can find all of this stuff. That's why I'm doing it in the order. I'm telling you, you can find all of these before you even start to graph. And then I'll show you how we can graph starting from this again, okay? But covertices then would be what? Something in negative one, something in negative one. Excellent, very good. Now the covertices would be changing along the X. So I know that this is gonna, again, always from the center. And what did we say it's going to change by? The square root of that in that direction. So that's that plus and minus two that we're now gonna go for that. I'm gonna take and I'm gonna add and subtract two to the X now. So that's why we said that it would already be the negative ones for my Y, but what would be one of my X values? Five. Three plus two, very good. And then three minus two, which is one. Now the only work that we have to do to actually find some stuff, and I mean work, none of that was work. We just took square roots and did it in that direction and did it in that direction from our center. Can I guess? I'd rather you not guess, I'd rather you tell me, how do we find the foci? What do we need to know? Midpoint formula. Not quite, not quite. We have to find what is called the focal distance, which remember, they use the letter C for that. And since this is a plus, we will take the minus, the difference of our a squared and b squared. So I know that c squared is gonna be, here's my a squared. Don't go back here and say this is my a and then square it to get back. They're already giving us a squared and b squared. So all we have to do is take the bigger one and subtract the smaller one. And why do we have to make sure we do that? What are we gonna have to do next to find c? Oh, the square root. And, you can't and we root can't negative. take the square root of negative values unless we want to deal with complex numbers, which that sounds too difficult or complex, right? So we will take the square root of this, which we know is just 12. And now we have our C is equal to, what does the square root of 12 break down to be? Three times square root two. Good, I know the square root of four, so I get a two and root three. Oh, what, two. Two is what we get to take the square root out, right? And the three would still be left in our root. Now don't forget our focus points, we call together foci, are going to be always in the bigger direction. So if this had the bigger number, everything that was important would have been in the X, that major axis. But the major axis this time is gonna be in the Y. So now we're gonna take that same center point and we're gonna go these distances, I say these because positive and negative, in the Y direction. So again, if I'm over here, I'm gonna put three comma something and three comma something. But this time that something is pretty ugly, isn't it? We're gonna have to go positive and negative two root three from the negative one. And can we actually take two root three and add it to a negative one? Does that give me one root three? If I have two of these and I add it to a negative one, does that give me only one of these? No. No. These are not the same. So remember, you cannot add or subtract things that are not alike. They have to be the same thing in order, like two numbers. We know those. We know how to add those. They're five. They're one. We cannot take a negative one and add two root threes and say we have any other variation. So guess what? It's negative one plus two root three and negative one minus two root threes. 
And those are what are called the exact focal points. Points. Notice it is still an X comma Y. And there are two of them, which is why they're called foci and not a focus, not just one. Okay, so what would we do in order to answer any one of these on our exam? Do exactly what we just did. Now, I'm trying to do just a few examples. So I gave you something here, made sure that you knew how to rewrite it in that standard form, and then are able to find anything and everything. But you may have questions that just ask for the center or the vertices or the foci or any of those things on your homework or test. So that should be pretty simple. I'm just throwing it all at you in one example so that we can knock it all out in one. Okay, do you guys wanna know how to graph this? Whoa. It didn't like that. So just to make sure that you can graph this. There's our equation. I'm just going to shrink it down a little bit. How do we graph that? Well, what do you guys know is the most important? What's the key? Center point. That center point, which we said was going to be at 3, negative 1. And then in order to graph, we only needed to know the A and the B. And we said that the A was going to be what? Four. And what would we be going for in? Uh, vertical directions. Good. In the Y directions. I like how you said it plural, Anthony. Because from my center, don't go back to the origin. From my center, everything has been done. I'm going to go up one, two, three, four, and down one, two, three, four. Then I'm going to take the square to this and I'm going to call it the B and I will go that in that direction from my what again? Center. Very good, Kev. So from there, I now have those four points we called the vertices and co-vertices. And guess what you can now do pretty easily? draw the ellipse good luck doing it as well as me but hey I got to set the bar high right but that's it now if we wanted to double check and make sure that all the answers that we got actually are what we we're saying they are over here you could okay but what I'm trying to show you is you don't need to graph in order to find those things and you don't need to find all of those things in order to graph. All right. So I wanted to do just one more example before we move on to a hyperbola. And that is, what if I gave you a few of these pieces over here and I asked you for that standard form of the equation? Let's see if you guys can put it together. I know because it's an ellipse, it's going to look like this. All I got to do is find the center and the A and the B. 
That's it. And what did they give us? The vertices and the foci. And what is not changing in our vertices? The X value. Which means, what do we already know? That it's the Y value that's changing on the major axis. Very good. So A is on Y. If these are our vertices, right? <clears throat> then we should also be able to find the distance that we did travel. So what can we use for these negative twos? How does that give me some stuff? And then what about the negative eight and two? Do these tell me anything about my center or my A and my B? Oh, wait, is that H equals two? Very good. So we can put a positive two there for my X. Because I know that didn't change, but the Y values did change. So I know my center, I know my center is somewhere along that major axis. But then one of them was down here at negative eight, and the other one was up here at positive two. And what do we know the center has to be? The midpoint between those two? That's right. That's what Richard was talking about earlier. And so what is the distance from zero? Two. And the distance from zero here? Eight. So that's a total distance of what? Ten. Ten, which we know our center has to be in the center of that, the halfway point. So it's a distance of what? Five. Which means... I have to either add or subtract five to either of these. See, we're just working backwards here. Hmm. And which one is it? That's the that's the A for the for the Y. I gotta add five to get a negative three there and subtract five to get a negative three there. And that just found my what? Oh. The the Y of my oh. Of the equation so plus that's three right. that's right so just to kind of write this down i know that those are a difference of 10. and if i want to find the middle which is my center then i'd have to take half of that to find the distance that we would have to have traveled And not only does that tell me that this would have to be a plus five and a negative five to get that negative three and negative three, what does this also tell us? And if you need to graph some of this stuff, guys, do it. That'll definitely help you see what we're dealing with. I just don't have a lot of room here. If we just found our center working backwards from our two vertices was a distance of five, we added five to this and we subtracted five to get that, then isn't five my A value? Yeah, it is. Wouldn't we not know that until we knew the value of Z determined which one is the higher no, great question and comment though, Richard, because they told us it was vertices. We know that the vertices are going to be our A, our bigger one. The co-vertices will be the smaller, the B value. Yeah, very good. Yeah, great question. So we know that we can use this. Now, careful, just don't put five there. Don't do all of that inference and understanding and put a five there because we know it should be 25. 
Yeah, five squared. Now the only thing that's missing is obviously what? B. We need to know what B is. If we know what B is, then we're done. But of course, they didn't give us anything about the covertices. They did tell us something about the foci. And remember, the foci is also in the y direction. Notice our x's have not changed. And can we find the distance between these, which we called c? I always like to go back to zero to find that whole distance. So from a negative seven and a positive one, what is that whole distance? Eight. And if the whole distance is eight, then we know the middle would be where our center is, right? Which would be four. So we knew that they had to travel that focal distance, that C of what? If I subtract four and I add four, notice what value do I get again? Negative three. Because that's my center. But how am I going to use the fact that I just found C is 4 to find the one thing that we need? Oh, the, you use the, the, uh, the focus equation and just solve for B? Excellent. Because remember, the whole key to this class is that you know that you have to get it down to one unknown and one equation. And you figured out the equation. And we know one, two parts now. And we can find the one that we need to know that third. Excellent. So what is C squared? What is A squared? And therefore, we can solve for B squared or B. So we get 16, 25. I'll go ahead and subtract the 25 over. So I get a negative 9 over here, negative b squared, and that would give me multiplying by a negative. Now I can take the square root and get b is 3. Which again, careful, what does that mean we put over here? So 9. That's it. Working backwards. Okay, a lot going on there, but wanted to try to make sure that I give you guys enough examples so that you can work on that homework and not have to go see myself or John later in the week after trying it on your own. So here's the good news. The next section is almost identical with a few little caveats, okay? So I put here the main difference between that section that we just went over and this one is one singular sign. The negative or subtraction symbol, that. That is the main difference, okay? So if we have everything that we had in the previous, which was our x minus eight squared plus our y minus k squared all equals one, and it was over whether the a and the b are flip-flopped or whatever, that. You guys ready for the big change? Because here it is. There it is. That's it. Could you go over that again? <laughs> uh, well done, Richard. Well done. <laughs> that is the big change. And instead of bringing those two parabolas together to create that ellipse, we're going to take them and break them apart, and we're going to face them in opposite directions. 
and we're going to get this. Call to what? A hyperbola. So if we went back to this and I told you here, we had like these two par parabolic shapes together and we're adding them, joining them together to create this. What if I split it right there and I turned them around? Do you see what we form? What do we call that when we take these two pieces and we turn them the other direction? What is one word that you could tell me we'd do? Inverse. Facing, facing them the what direction? Opposite. Yep. And what symbol do we use for opposite in math? If I asked you for the opposite of five, what would you tell me? Negative five. So when I said opposite, you said this symbol. Notice, there it is again. I'm going over it again slowly for you. Richard. <laughs> Thank you. It is simply changing that to then, instead of adding them, joining them together as an ellipse, boom, they're facing in opposite directions out. And again, that can be a horizontal or a vertical ellipse. All right. Now, in order to draw these things, it's a little bit crazier. Because you guys know how wide is a parabola when you draw it. Well, some of you give me one that's this. Some of you give it a little wider. Some a little. I need that Goldilocks. I need that one that's just right. Because remember, the reason we're graphing is to represent every single solution to some equation. Well, then you can't have one like this and then somebody else like this and somebody else real narrow like that. So we're going to have to draw these guidelines. And do you guys remember what we called guidelines throughout this course? Asymptotes. Watch your mouths. That's right. It is the asymptote that's coming back, which is why these are dashed. They're not part of our graph, but they are necessary for us all to have this same shape in our graph, okay? So we'll still have these focal points, which will be inside of our parabola shapes facing opposite directions, we call a hyperbola. We'll still have these vertices. We'll still have these covertices. But instead of combining them all to create a circle or an ellipse, like we did the previous two sections, we will now draw this imaginary box through the four of them. So that we can, through the corners of this box, say that X marks the spot. That's where we will find the treasure in order to draw these hyperbolas correctly. And remember, they will always be drawn at the vertices, the vertex. Because if I didn't want them to be horizontal, everything will be done the same, except now my A term will be here and here, and then we would draw it like this. Okay? So they call that main one, instead of now the major axis, they're calling it the transverse axis. Okay? That's what we're going to draw these, and it's going to transverse or go through. Okay? The conjugate will be that other one, that smaller axis for our co-conjugate. You can remember it that way, our co-vertices, okay? Our transverse axis will now be for hyperbolas where we will be transversing or drawing these things through, okay? And remember, guys, you've got to think outside of the box. And that's my little joke that you will never – when you go to graph these and you draw your asymptotes, you will never come back in here at the center and draw it that way. Because I will have people do that all the time. Okay, always think outside of the box. It's going to be out here. Okay, at those vertices. Okay, never inside of that imaginary little box that we dash. Okay, 
So there is another look for you for a horizontal hyperbola and a vertical hyperbola. And again, that will all depend on the A's. The A's. But the way that these look is a little bit different. And what I mean by that is the A and the B, it's still going to be the A is the bigger one, but it's not always the bigger number. And here's what I mean by that, okay? You can have 16 here and a 9 there. Which one of those two is bigger? 16. Nope. Anthony's like, no, what do you mean no? Anthony, you forgot the signs, right? If this is positive and this is negative, now we got to pay attention to those. So yes, Anthony, you were correct. 16 is always going to be bigger than nine, but you got to pay attention to which one is negative now. Okay. Wait, so the negative one is the bigger one? No, never. Oh, okay. So if I put 16 there, now is it the bigger one, Anthony? Uh, so, yeah, no, it wouldn't be. Right. So you were correct in that 16 is bigger than 9 always, but since this was the positive, it's always going to be the bigger one. And since this is always going to be negative, it's always going to be the smaller one. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry if I confused you there. No, okay, I get it now. So whatever one is second will always be the B. But notice, how does that then mean that we can change it if we always write it alphabetical, X and then Y? If the A is always going to be the positive and the B is always going to be the negative, well, then we're going to have to switch our order for our X and our Y. And that's what I start getting worried about. And the reason I get worried about it is, how do we always find our center point? Opposite, opposite. H, K, because it's our X and then our Y, and that's how we always write is in that order. But if it's no longer in that order, what do you gotta be careful of? Because you don't write it as K, H. Yes, right? The H would still always be with the X and the Y with the K but it's not going to just be left and then right. So if you talk about it, it's going to be like a KH in that format, but they kept it alphabetical. So it's still going to always be HK, but again, remember it's going to be this first comma and then that second would be my Y. All right, so just be careful of that. Notice one other thing that's different. Those axes and all that are still going to be the 2A and the 2B. But notice, I'll highlight it here. To find that focal distance, notice the one big change. It's always going to be the opposite of whatever our original is. Because remember with the ellipse, it was a plus here and it was a minus here. But for these, it's a minus here, so it's going to be a plus here to find that focal distance. There's also those values that we're gonna be talking about for the asymptotes. Okay, and remember the asymptotes are lines. And so sometimes they'll ask you for the equation of that line. And if it's through the point zero, zero, then this doesn't exist. So the main point that I want you guys to be able to figure out is what the slope of these lines are. And remember, slope is always the rise over the run or the change in our y's over the change in our x's. And since it's always that, then Whatever this is, which is how far we would have gone in the Y, and whatever this is, which is how far we would have gone in the X, those will always give you your slopes of your asymptotes. 
And since they're always keeping the B under the Y there and the A under the X, or here, now it would be the, oops, sorry, the A, why does it keep moving? The A over the B. It's always going to be whatever the Y part is over the X. Okay, so you can see it's a little bit different on this one. All right. So that's pretty much it for these. Just wanted to go over one example, and then we'll wrap it up with parabolas and call it good. Okay. So again, if you can label all of this stuff, great. I won't do it all with you guys again, but I do want to make sure that you can rearrange this because there is one tricky part, and I'll start by adding over the constant and then grouping my x's and the y's. So I got a 9x squared minus 36x. I know I'm going to have to add something to. And then careful, it's a negative. 4y squared minus 40y, and then I know I'm going to have to add something to both sides. But because there's a leading coefficient, what are we going to have to do first? Factor out that 9, which gives me x squared minus 4x. Then I'm going to have plus my box and then over here I'm going to do the same type idea but I'm going to divide out a negative 4 which will give me my positive 1 my y squared careful this is where most people make a mistake that's now going to be positive 10y and then plus my box all equals what well, I know I got the 388, but what are these going to have to be in order to keep things accurate and equivalent? Well, remember, before I even fill in these boxes, I know that this is nine times that. So in order to keep it equal over here, I'm going to have to do nine times that. And careful, on the other side, what's being done? Well. To the y's, it would have to be distributed by negative 4 to get back my original stuff. So this one is actually being negative 4 times that. So guess what I'm going to have to do over here to keep it equal? Negative 4 times that. It's the only way to keep things equal. Although you won't see them here and here, you have to see it on the outside that that's what's actually happening is 9 times this and negative four times this. So I have to do the same on this side to keep it equivalent. Cool? Because then from there, half of this, negative two, squared is four. Half of this, positive five, squared is 25. And that's what goes into those respective boxes. Then I know that this factor is to be nine X what squared? Negative 4y what squared? Negative 2 there. Positive 5 there. And it's all equal to whatever this mess becomes. That's a positive 36. This is a negative 100. If I have 4 quarters, that's 100. So I'll take the 388 and subtract 100. So I got 288 and I will add 36 to it. So eight and six, 14, nine and three is 12. And then that gives me a 324. All good there. So my last step is to get it set equal to one by dividing everything by 324. And I know this cancels to be a one. I wanna see what else cancels. I know four goes into 32 eight times and not once. So I get y plus five squared over 81, and that was negative. 
and then nine. Let's see if that goes in. Well, add these up. What's three plus two plus four? That equals nine. So since all of this adds up to nine, I know it's gonna be divisible by nine. It's a little division trick I think I showed you all earlier in the semester. So I know nine's gonna go into it, I just don't know how many times. So nine goes into 30, three times, which is 27. And I'll have five left over, bring down the four. And I know nine goes in that six times. And that, my friends, is the standard form for now what we call a hyperbola. So help me out. Can you tell me the center, the A, the B, the vertices? What else did they ask for? Covertices, foci, and asymptotes. Now remember on your homework and or test, I can ask for any one of these things. I probably will not ask you for all. Because then I'd have to make the points for that particular problem worth like 10. Because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then three points for getting to here. That'd be a huge problem, right? So I may just ask you to put it in this form and answer this, or this, or whatever. Okay, so real quick, what's the center? Two, negative five. Now be careful with that. Kevin, everyone, make sure that you're giving me the X first and the Y second. He was lucky that we were still in this order, but if I switched some things around and put the negative there, the positive there, that would have been flip-flopped and we would have given what instead? Uh, negative five, two. That's right, that's right. So again, just look out for that when they're those negatives. You always gotta be careful around negative people. Negatives, okay? So be careful with that. Then my A and my B, what do we say? Anthony, what is always going to be your A? The one on the left. Yep, because it's always positive where this one is negative. So even though this appears to be bigger, it's negative. We always know that the positive is the bigger number. Very good. So we got our plus and minus six, our plus and minus nine. Those are nice, perfect squares. That's good. Now, if you wanted to take those and use it to find the foci first, we can go ahead and do that. Remember, it's C squared equals A squared. What B squared? Plus B squared. Good, it's always the opposite of whatever's there. And since we know both of those already, the order doesn't really matter for this because we are adding. So I'll take the 36 and 81, add them together, which is 117, and then we'll take the square root of that to say that our focal distance is that. Now, can we break that number down a little bit? Well, if I just add one, one, and seven, I know that adds up to nine, so I definitely know nine goes into it. So I know I can rewrite this as nine. How many times does nine go into 11? One. With how many left over? Two, and then bring down our seven. And how many times does nine go into that? Uh, three. And I know the square root of nine, so I can say that this is actually three root 13. And what is it going to be done to? The X or the Y from my center?
everything, the vertices, the foci, all of that stuff is going to be in the x direction because it is the positive, the bigger one, my a term. So I know for this, I'm going to go what from my center? Plus or minus 3 root 13. So that would be 2 plus 3 root 13, comma negative 5, and 2 minus 3 root 13. Oops. 3 root 13, comma negative 5. Sorry, I kind of running out of room there. My vertices, those would be done also in the x by a distance of a. So I would be going plus and minus 6 from there. So my vertices would be 8, comma, negative 5 and negative 4, comma, negative 5. My co-vertices would be done in the y direction with a plus and minus of 9. So 9 minus 5 would be 2 comma 4 and 2 comma negative 14. And then lastly, my asymptotes, which we know is going to be y equals plus and minus some slope h comma k, which was a negative 2 negative five. And what do we say slope is always the what over the what? And since my rise is always in the y value and we went this in the y direction, then it's going to be nine over what did we go in the x direction? Six. But of course, what are they going to want us to do if we can with that? Simplify. Which would be three halves. Okay, in order to graph all that, you would have to apply a lot of it, which means we would start at negative two, or excuse me, positive two, negative five. So right two, down five. And then from there, we would march six in our x directions, nine in our y, and then through those points, we would draw this imaginary box and through the corners in the center of our, we would draw our asymptotes. In which one of those pairs, the x's or the y's, would we be drawing our, para our hyperbola? Always got to keep it positive. So these would be my big, wide open hyperbola arches that we draw. And that's how you would graph. Okay. So I, I had another one on here that kind of went over some, similar to the uh, previous or second example that we did in the uh, ellipse section, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip that right now to quickly wrap up today with the parabola, okay? Parabola you should know a lot about already, but we're gonna talk about more in-depth things like the vertex and the opening with our axis of symmetry, because if we go this way, it's gonna give you the same y value. But then we're gonna add in a focal point. We call it focus, which will always be on the inside of it. And this line on the outside called the directrix. Okay, they'll even talk about the thing, it's called the lattice rectum. So kind of a weird name, I know. Um, but that's gonna be the distance through the focus of how wide your opening is. So you don't need to plot a bunch of points in order to actually graph nicely, okay? So that focal distance that we go is gonna be the same to our focus as it is the directrix. So if this is my focal point, 
then this would be the directrix, which would be the same distance from the vertex. So instead of it being done from the center like all the other ones, we have the most critical value. Everything's done from the vertex. Okay, so here are all the options here, which means we are going to be going both in the positive x, positive y, positive y, excuse me, positive x, negative x, positive y, and negative y directions. And these will be the new equations that we're going to be looking at for our graph. The nice thing is that focal distance that we had to use in the previous two, which is c squared equals a squared something b squared, the opposite, whatever the sign is, these are really easy. It's just whatever's in front. It's that 4p. We're just going to have to divide by 4. And that's going to be the distance that we will go in both directions from our vertex, whether that's up and down or left and right. And remember, the focus will always be inside the directrix, the line on the outside. Okay. Of course, it's not always going to be centered at 0, 0. So we could have our y squared equals 4p times x. But it can also be shifted by h and k. So everything will be done the same other than we're now shifting that vertex some direction and going that from there. So I know that was a quick overview. If you guys need to rewind it back and watch it again, just this part, or this is in our ebook, which remember you can do both online or on an app. Okay, all that information is there for you. I wanna make sure I do at least one example with you and we'll find some of this stuff, okay? What direction is this one going to be? Whatever the single exponent is. If it's squared, then that's not going to give us the direction. Okay, and all that is listed here, of course. X direction, X direction. And if that number in front of it is negative, it's gonna go in the negative direction. If it's positive, positive direction. Okay. So I know we're out of time. If anybody wants to stick around and go over this, otherwise I can pause the video and then just record me going over this. I don't want to keep you guys over the time. I do apologize. A lot of stuff to go over in these four sections, but I'll go ahead and pause it. All right, guys, so let's just do this one example, and hopefully that'll be enough. y squared equals negative 16x. This is already in the form that we prefer, which, remember, is that 4p times x. And that is going to give us what we need in order to find both that directrix and focal point, the focus. All right? Since there's no adding or subtracting to the x or the y, we know that this is centered at zero, zero. So when they asked us to find the vertex, focus, directrix, and endpoints of that lattice rectum, which I think I did not cover. I want to make sure that you guys at least see what that is there. The distance from here to here is 2p and 2p. So it is actually exactly 4p. So that distance, that lattice rectum distance is actually already given to us. But notice they had absolute values around it because it's talking about a distance. So we know the distance of that lattice rectum is equal to 4p, so that is just 16. Okay, they just wanted the endpoints for it as well. So we know the vertex for this one is at zero, zero. 
the focus and directrix are going to be found by P. That will be that focal distance that we talked about previously. And because this is negative, we know it's going to go in the negative x direction. Okay, so what is that P value? Well, we know it's equal to that part in front, which is negative 16. So all we have to do is divide by four. And we get that distance that we will travel. And you guys remember, in order to get directions, you need to focus. So whatever this comes out, that's gonna give you the focus first in order to get your directions. That's my little joke to hopefully help you remember what is what. So we have now found that we're going to be going in the x direction, we said, because this is squared. So this is going to change, not that. Okay, just like we did the previous two units or sections. So I'm going to be going a negative four to get my focus. And remember, we focus on a point. The directrix is a line. And since we're going in the x direction, we know that if we were to graph this, we will start at 0, 0, and we will go negative 1, 2, 3, 4 to get our focal point, which means we have to do the opposite of that to get our directions, which would be positive 4. But how do I put this? directrix. Do I put 0 comma 4? Well, no, remember this is not a point. And if my parabola is going this way, I know that my directrix will not intersect it. It will not be going this way. So how can we say this line right here? Is it an x equals something or is it a y equals something? What's true about everything on this line? Are all the y's the same? No, all the x's. Good. So that means we're going to put x equals what? Positive 4. Yes. So it would be done to that. So remember, we're not only going to do the opposite of the sign, we're going to do the opposite of... Hold on a sec. I did that wrong. Try not to erase everything there. Because everything is being done in the x direction, we should have been changing everything in the x, right? So this would be negative four comma zero, not zero negative four. I said it at the beginning and then I didn't do it. Apologies. Okay. So our focal point is there at negative four comma zero. Our directrix is this line x equals four, which is true about all of these. And then all we need to graph this is the endpoints of that lattice rectum, which we already know the whole distance is 16. And therefore, we know half of that would be eight. So we go to where our focal point is, and we will go from here a distance of eight. And I'm gonna put negative, but even though it's just a distance, right? Those would be our endpoints, which allow us to draw this perfect symmetrical parabola. Okay, so what would those endpoints be? Well, remember, we already have this, and we're just going to add 8, and we're going to subtract 8 to that focal point to get those. And again, those would be in the y direction this time, not the x. So I will take my focus, and I will add and subtract 8 to the y value. So we would get negative 4, 8, and negative 4, negative 8. So how can this be made a little bit more challenging? Not being at zero, zero for our vertex. 
it's easy to add and subtract things to zeros. All right. So I know that was a long one today. Again, I apologies, uh, apologize for going over a little bit. I'm glad some of you stuck with me. I will post this as soon as I can so that you guys can watch it back. Otherwise, come see me during my office hours or go visit RTA.